Brian Trupek, Senior Vice President of Product with Digicert. Thanks very much for joining us on MySecurity TV. Thanks for having me, Chris. I'm happy to be here. Great. Uh, Brian, you're there in Austin, Texas. So welcome to the show. Uh, we're going to be talking about digital trust. Uh, with a company name like Digicert, it pretty much says a lot already. Uh, maybe introduce us to uh, Digicert. And uh, as we said, digital trust is a big topic uh, as well. And it's very uh, current here in Australia uh, and the Asia Pacific region. Yeah, Digicert. And then I think that'll uh, lead us into some of your uh, product suite. Sure. Yeah. So Digicert is the global leader in digital trust. Uh, digital trust involves the business processes and technologies that help us engage in our connected world with confidence that our digital footprint is secure. And so what that means is within an organization, all the interconnected pieces of really kind of the IT, even OT technology uh, that's being delivered um, that you know ultimately is creating trust for the customer. And so when we look at those pieces, we build upon a pretty rich foundation of being the world leader in public uh, PKI, digital certificates, um, and really nail that technology across a, a series of workflows that help us feed into the digital trust um, paradigm to allow customers to solve that problem. Um, I think one of the key things we've seen just anecdotally is as, as everything kind of crossed through the pandemic, you know, a lot of people decided to work from home, right? There's all this work from home. Yeah. Um, what they maybe didn't think of as employees was there's a lot of infrastructure that had to change behind that, right? A lot of security, a lot of network, a lot of servers, a lot of compute. That meant a lot of security solutions had to be deployed very, very rapidly. And I think now what we're seeing is folks trying to get their head around that and, and work on that. And that's just one aspect, right? But you can see a very rapid, complex change to a security perimeter and the associated security fabric of what that takes, that's multidisciplinary in a company, right? That's guys off in DevOps with their hair on fire deploying code like crazy. That's dudes over in the identity access management lane, maybe the crypto policy guys. And usually somebody like the CISO who's trying to overlook all of that yeah. and say, how does this all work? And can we enforce policy? Can we manage risk? Can we navigate against outages and downtime? And, and why is that important? Because from a customer perspective, um, you know, we actually did a cert, we did a, a digital trust survey in, in 2022 um, in the APAC region itself. 91% of consumers are more concerned about cyber threats uh, more than the rest of the world. So you yeah. guys are more concerned than everywhere else. Like that was like one of the interesting findings that came out of that. But even if you go one level deeper than that, um, you know, the survey also revealed that if companies don't manage digital trust, 88% of their customers would consider switching with 57% saying switching would be likely, right? So that's all from your region. Um, and I think that's why trust is so critical, so important and can't be overlooked for what we're doing. And that's why Digicert, um, you know, as the leaders in digital trust and a long history in PKI and, and associated public trust services, um, you know, we're really set to take this next leap and, and really help organizations with this problem. Well, it's very topical, particularly in Australia, after on the back of a couple of significant breaches uh, last year, uh, affecting millions of Australians as well. What's the breadth of DigiCert? Because, uh, again, this is a, a big topic. So, you know, you've got uh, a lot there. What would be the breadth of DigiCert in terms of a company and your sort of product suite? So DigiCert, at our heart, right, we have been a PKI provider, public trust, SSL certificates, global leader. Um, we also do that for private trust, right? So for corporations that have their own trust ecosystem or IoT vendors and operators or network operators that need their own trust ecosystems, we've done those things. But we also go deeper than that, right? And so we deploy systems and workflows that are built on top of PKI. PKI is at the heart of it. It's a very complex kind of sinister thing people don't really understand. Yeah. And so our tools try and make it very, very easy to use those things. And the tooling hits at a layer where, you know, organizations that are doing things with IoT uh, and manufacturing IoT devices, discovering IoT devices in the IT side of the organization. So kind of IT, OT convergence, deployment, manufacturing of them, uh, as well as moving into document trust solutions. So where organizations are exchanging PKI cryptographic based signatures um, and software trust solutions where organizations um, are signing workloads, maybe they're running in the cloud or code signing things and providing that auditable, 
reputable format for what's what's being executed so it can be trustworthy. And then really last but not least, and I think kind of the topic of our recent press release is our trust lifecycle manager, which is the holistic single pane of glass to allow customers to manage those user device and um, server uh, authentication workloads and uh, certificates related to the infrastructure. And I think it's, it's one of those domains that are often uh, poorly represented or poorly appreciated as well, uh, particularly from say a CISO and the, and the, and the team uh, perspective for, for uh, corporate security. With a single pane of glass, what kind of lifecycle management do they need? Because it's things like keeping these certificates current, updating them, uh, you know, even down to new patches coming through as well. Yeah, how does that kind of assist uh, and from a large enterprise perspective? Yeah, and it it's not just from that CISO perspective, kind of the, the oddities of PKI. It's one of my favorite things as a party trick. People are saying, what do you do for a living PKI? Uh, and they're like, what in the world is that? And it's like, well, it's in your pocket. It's on your phone. It's on that it's smart everywhere. watch you have. It's on the TV, the thermometer, right? It's yeah. everywhere, right? And so um, what's fascinating is as you look at it being everywhere, it goes into how, how enterprises are using this. And what we see, especially I was just in um, Australia, I spent a week out there with a number of customers, about two dozen customers. And there's this recurring theme. And what the customers keep telling me everywhere, right, it's universal, is number one, you know, these certificates, like kind of like little time bombs, right? They have an expiration date. They're going to explode at some point and something yeah. isn't going to work. And that's terrifying, right? There's a huge risk problem there that, that you, you see, right? Um, and, you know, in, in our did it, in our automation survey that we did just a couple of years ago, we talked to enterprises, 400 enterprises. Uh, and in a one year period, uh, I think it was upwards of almost 70 percent of those enterprises saw a outage related to a certificate expiration. And then I think it was 30 percent just from memory that uh, saw up to five outages in that same period from certificate expirations. These are real things, man. Yeah. Right. And so the complexity related to this and the cost related to those outages is huge. And so what the customers keep telling me is, is we need to solve that problem. These things can't be expiring. They can't be bringing things down. They're everywhere and they're just being used more and more um, all over the environment. And so they want to be able to find them, inventory them, discover them in an ever changing population, right? As it's always the security perimeters changing, new things coming on, new things going off. How do I get my hands around everything that's there? And then once I have it all, how do I determine what I want to work with? Like what, what needs to be managed and what doesn't? Because there's some things I just, I'm never going to care about. They're not going to bring yeah. something. Don't tell me about it. Well, it's only, but then I, there's other things that are critical, right? And they're like, say, it's only when it's working, right? So as long as everything right. is working, yeah. it's only when it doesn't work. Uh, and these uh, certificates are expiring or not aligned or integrated to, to others. That's when it creates issues. I imagine it's hard to find if you, unless you are using something like a, a lifecycle manager, you may not sort of be alert to that uh, in, in a timely fashion. Um, exactly. Why? Why do they? Why do these certificates expire? How long do they generally last? You know, is it is it just different for everyone? And then my other question I had was, how much automation can you feed into this? So, you know, as long as long as that digital trust is inbuilt or embedded uh, within that uh, process. Yeah, you're you're going down the right path there. So those are those are the right kinds of questions, right? So. The expiration time can be pretty variable, right? So you can, we, we like at Digicert, we have devices deployed at the bottom of the ocean and at the edge of the solar, like the edge of the solar yeah. system, literally. Yeah. Those things are going to last hundreds of years, right? Because you can't change them ever. Got it. Um, and so there's, you can do that. That's a really bad idea generally. I mean, something's pretty safe in those distances. Somebody's not going to generally yeah. hack that. Um, but when you bring it back on Earth, Right, you're looking at from a publicly trusted certificate. Those timeframes have shrank over the years, and now it's one year basically that right. is the long you're going to get. Um, and then actually, shorter life cycles are are being used um, by many systems. You know, ninety days, sixty days. Some some customers even go shorter. Um, is it simply and sorry to interrupt? Is it simply because of the encryption changes? Uh, yeah, and those so it's kind of things. Yeah, it's looking at the risk, that like kind of that risk vector, right? right. So as as, as you look at you know PKI and you look at the negotiation of the handshake with a web browser and what it's doing and, and how authentication occurs and all this, there's a lot of layers in there, right? And there's a lot from an attack perspective, nobody's broken RSA. That's the algorithm that protects everything. Yeah. You know, you say that knock on wood, but that's that's that hasn't happened. That's a big math problem that isn't going to happen. But what people do is they pick apart at the rest of the protocol, 
And we have seen breaches in that, right? We have seen people pick apart like a hash algorithm on MD5 and that broke things. And so that's why the timeframes keep coming down uh, to make the uh, attack timeframe on a certificate um, much harder to do, right? Because yeah. the cert lives lives shorter. And, and when you look at an organization on the private side where they, they have their own PKI for their enterprise, there they have more latitude. And we'll typically see customers do things maybe in the three-year kind of time span for certificates. Yeah. But it all becomes, it goes back to what you are just asking about a second ago. It comes back to they're going to expire at some point. And our system tells them about that, right? So now they know the things that are are in their inventory. And then our job is to tell them, you know, policy violations, God forbid you find an MD5 certificate these days, but we still do sometimes. Yeah. Bad, that needs to go away. Uh, and then if we find something that is expiring, expired, and, and people have processes, every customer is different. They have a different process for how they want to manage expirations. It goes through corporate enterprise change management, or it goes to a specific set of individuals. And maybe that's by region or data center. A lot of complexity in there. So our system has to be flex flexible to allow these customers to model that in our system, to get that information to the right place. And then like you said, well, what happens with it? You don't want to have yeah. a whole bunch of people manually touching this environment and moving certs around. That's that's scary, right? And one of the most surprising things I see, and even I heard this in Australia, it's not unique to Australia. So, you know, let's calm down. But around the world is people are still managing these things with spreadsheets, PowerShell script, <laughs> or link to spreadsheets to go run yeah. automated commands on production servers. It's it's crazy town. Um, and so what, what our customers are looking for is obviously a more enterprise way to do that. And they want that automated. They want that you know policy built in for how the crypto should be managed through the automation, working with the enterprise change management processes. And then last but not least, integrated all the things they care about. Right. And that could be Active Directory. That could be ServiceNow. Yeah. That could be the HashiCorps. What's in their infrastructure uh, and how it gets there. And, and that kind of completes that customer story I was talking about earlier where they, they tell me that's my problem. Help me find them. Help me manage them against policy. Tell the right people about them at the right time so they don't explode. And then give me an automated, repeatable way that connects with the things in my infrastructure to get them in the right places. Nice. How much configuration is needed in this? So let's say we're bringing on uh, the sort of trust lifecycle manager. Does it is it automatically finding certificates, or as you say, you might have to upload that spreadsheet uh, <laughs> to the platform? How much? Uh, yeah, onboarding for the customer. Because I'm just thinking from a CISO's perspective of, a, of an enterprise going, you know what, we're not managing our cert certificates very well. Uh, this is something we might need to address. What type of onboarding or customer integration uh, is required? Yeah, it, it varies depending on the complexity of the customer and, the, and their Got deployment it. infrastructure, right? And I think, you know, generally speaking, we try to make the system very easy to use and easy to get data under management. Uh, uh, connect with, you know, Digicert publicly issuing and privately issuing CAs. Um, coming at the end of this quarter is connecting with third-party external CAs from other providers, so it'll work across everything. Um, but do, putting those pieces together, um, you know, it can take time because, you know, you talk about spreadsheets, but from a, a, a building that book of record perspective, people have stuff in file systems. People have stuff on on like desktops in their you know crypto store on Cappy on Windows or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, file uh, servers over here, maybe Microsoft CAs over here, and there's a lot of them in the enterprise that pop up like weeds, and they can't stamp them all down, and and they never do. So there's all these places. You know, Hashi's got certs in it now. ServiceNow's got certs in it now. So it's really about getting all of those things into one place um, as the customer needs, right? Because that's the other thing. It can become overwhelming fast if they try to bite it all off. Typic it. Typically, customers will go and say, hey, you know what? Here's what I see as my highest risk area and systems. Start with those. Let's index, figure out some policy, implement how we're going to do this, and then let's pivot and go to the next one, the next one, the next one. So it is something that you can build maybe on, on risk uh, appropriate uh, sort of approach as well. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I suppose the last one is changes in the environment as well and the general threat landscape. You, you did touch on that, but sort of outlook in digital trust. Uh, you mentioned you did a survey last year as well. The implications of this over sort of the next sort of immediate term on what uh, Digicert is working on, what's your outlook for the year? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the survey there and it feeds into that outlook, right? Another, another data point that came out of there was of those... Um, 
those uh, enterprise organizations uh, in that survey, they had on average about 50,000 server certificates they were managing. Uh -huh. So that's let alone the unmanaged. There's stuff that they're not managing that's crawling around and, and stuff they don't know happening, but that's only in the server space, right? You also have users, you have devices, you have uh, kind of the DevOps segments of things that are really springing up these days where, where PK is being used quite heavily. Um, and it's that view across that whole plane. And, and when you think about the average enterprise, they have about 50,000 employees. If each of those employees has an a iPad, an uh, iPhone, and a desktop, and you're accessing Wi-Fi, VPN, whatever they're doing for remote work or in office, you can have, you know, for each user, five certs. So, you know, now you've got 250,000 certs there, 300,000 total in the organization you're managing. This sprawl goes across yeah. these teams, the IAM team, the crypto team, the DevOps team. And so when we look at the future, what we're doing and, and our whole roadmap is just about getting more and more of those integrations in and, and getting more of that um, automation um, uh, application across across that organization so that PKI can just be completely automated and you can have that one whole central view on everything. And everything's hard because it changes. There's new stuff all the time. And so yeah. that's why we really built this as a platform, which is very extensible by third parties and everyone else to be able to plug in that ever-changing landscape of things that you know need to be connected. Does it assist with say third-party risk management and the like and other supply chains or is it more integrated just to the IT systems within that environment itself? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. I mean, it can certainly feed information in, right? Policy risk information that they may try to mine from this type of environment. Uh, yeah. But it's not like an inherent risk system like that, uh, you know, on its own. But it definitely could be used to feed information into those sources for, uh, for an organization. Nice. One last question to finish off. Sure. The, the skill sets in this area, uh, you know, what's your observations there? It's one of those things of encryption uh, and cryptography is also often been one of those areas that from a security professional's perspective, it's either a real challenge or they keep away from it, or it's one of those deep dives where they become quite, ex, ex, uh, have expertise in it. What's the yeah. general skill sets do you see? And how does this potentially, you know, a lifecycle manager uh, sort of assist a security team? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a huge assistance because it makes it accessible to all of the folks in those teams um, in a way that it hasn't been before, right? So yeah. I think that's that's the first bit. The second bit awareness, is, I imagine, yeah, 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 and, and the the people. I mean, I don't know if I'm supposed to say something like this or whatnot, but I love the Australian people. I love what is going on from an, uh, a crypto perspective there literally some of the most fascinating conversations and customers, like the use cases that come out of Australia are incredible. We, we have internal conversations about literally our whole product being pushed in new directions because of the things that we surface in Australia. And I'm not making that right. up. It's a, it's a real, it's kind of a problem actually, because it pushes <laughs> us to do things. We we're like, man, when's everybody else going to catch up to this? But we have to go do things and innovate to keep up with what's going on. Because uh, there's some very smart people doing things in very incredible ways in Australia. Um, and it's one of the reasons I spend so much time there is because I love being with the smart people. They're smarter than me. They educate me every single time and help me, you know, figure out how we can connect that product to make it easy for everybody, but yeah. make it powerful for those real smart guys to be able to get done the, the things they need to get done to. As you, as, as you just said, it's the smart people at this end I always find in terms of uh, this particular domain. Um, Brian, how can we find out more, mate? I've, I've got the website up. It's digicert.com, Trust Lifecycle Manager. Uh, but I take it you've got people within the region. Where's uh, What's your, your footprint here in Australia and New Zealand? Yeah, so we do. We have uh, offices in Melbourne and Sydney. But yeah, we've got people in region. Um, I get out there uh, usually once a quarter and, and hang out with the customers and hear from y'all. Uh, but we have feet on the street. We have folks that can help you and talk to you and, and show you demo and, and answer your questions. Uh, look, I did mention it. We'll have it in the show notes. Digicert.com, Trust Lifecycle Manager. Definitely a platform worth having a look at. Uh, Brian Trupek uh, there in Austin, Texas, the Senior Vice President of Product with Digicert. Thanks very much for joining us on our Tech and Sec Weekly. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate the time. Thanks, Brian.